Hello, and welcome. I am Exolite, and this is my channel. Today I'm going to do a story about a man who vanished. He vanished off of a mountain in Seaward, Alaska. It's a particularly sad story, because as you will see, it eventually comes down to a lawsuit between a family who didn't just lose a family member, but never saw him again. Never saw anything to suggest he'd been on the mountain. And a group of people responsible for the event which the man took place in, and of course, ultimately, where he vanished. So this is a little different from usual. I'd like you to sit back, listen to the story, and leave your comments. Tell me what you think of the situation and how it was handled. And let's have a discussion about this. Let's get started, shall we? Paul Michael Lamott, who was called Michael, was a man like most others aren't. At 65 years old, Michael Lamott decided that he was going to compete in the Mount Marathon race in Seaward, Alaska, which is south of the city of Anchorage. This was an extreme event and he was last seen on July 4th, about 200 feet from the top of Mount Marathon, which has a 3,022 feet high peak. He was never seen again, and his body was never located despite extensive searching. Michael was lost without a trace. None of his clothing was even found. Michael, at 65 years old, was competing for the first time in the 85th running of this race, with participants running up the mountain surrounded by thick forests, creeks, and over 3.5 miles, starting in downtown Seaward. Racers would run a half a mile to the bottom of Mount Marathon, then they would scramble about 2,900 vertical feet straight up cliffs and mud and shale before getting to the race point which was an artificial summit point then the racers turn around and go downhill over snowfields and rock fields waterfalls and crags until they finally reach the finish line back on the streets of seaward there is an entry limit to the amount of people who can run this race 90 percent of the participants are returnees and the way to get into this race is with a coveted lottery and Michael had made it into the race and usually in the 2012 event three people were hurt including one man who suffered very severe head injuries this was the first time in the history of the race that anyone had ever been injured or died or gone missing. In a pre-race safety talk, Tim Lebling told the racers, if you have not been up to that mountain before, you should consider going home right now because you should not be in this race. But Michael was undeterred. He was fit and healthy and having been a regular visitor to the gym and just finished a 12k event a month earlier he felt as though he could make it so despite the warning he never once chose to not continue in hindsight that was a decision that his family has to live with 
Michael started in the second wave of the race, which started at 3.15 p.m. At about 5.45 p.m., Tom Walsh saw Michael ascending to the turnaround point with about 200 feet to go. At this point, the area was starting to become foggy and cold, but Walsh saw no reason to be concerned about the condition of Michael. Walsh asked Lamott for his bib number, and he replied, 548. And as he descended back towards the town, he texted race officials. Bib number 548 would be home in about an hour and a half. Unfortunately, Michael never made it back. Hours later, search and rescue teams were called onto the mountain at around 8 o'clock by his wife, Peggy, and the temperatures were falling, and it began to rain. And it wasn't until early the next morning that the Alaska State Troopers helicopter, which was equipped with infrared radar, was scanning the mountain. Searchers were worried that if he wasn't already injured, he probably had hypothermia because of his light clothing, exhaustion, and freezing weather. Again, make note that it wasn't until quite early in the morning the next day that they sent a helicopter with infrared to search for heat after this man had been up in the freezing cold all night. Then, the next morning after that, the rescue squadron of the Alaska Air National Guard, which specializes in searching for crash pilots and missing hikers, arrived with their helicopter for another infrared scan. A team of up to 60 searchers crawled around that mountain. They looked everywhere. They even looked on the other side of the mountain, away from the race course. Four days after Lamotte disappeared, the official rescue attempt was called off. Michael's daughter had flown in, and with the Seward Volunteer Fire Department, they kept looking. She didn't want to leave her dad there. His wife didn't want to leave her husband there. A cadaver dog was called in and sent into the area, and friends paid for and analyzed high-resolution photographs of the mountain. Now keep in mind, this is an organized event. It's been going on 80-plus times. There was nothing in place to search for a missing runner. It was taking an extremely long time to get infrared in there. And then the family and their friends had to pay to have and to analyze high resolution photographs of the mountain. In the end, mountain rescue experts, firemen, state troopers, search dogs, and Michael's family spent thousands of hours searching the area and did not find a single clue that he'd even been on the mountain. If it wasn't for the fact that he had been witnessed on the mountain, nobody would know he had been there. And that is strange. So even after the official search was called off in mid-July, volunteers continued to search the mountain. Michael's daughter, Marianne, was quoted as saying, Seaward has so much meaning to my dad. He is here, looking out. He's on Mount Marathon somewhere. And something I'm going to touch on real quickly, we'll come back around to that, is that in July 2013, Michael's widow sued the Seward Chamber of Commerce, which organizes the race, for $5 million. And eventually settled in October 2014 for $20,000. Afterwards, race organizers instituted a number of new safety measures in 2013, including mandatory sign statements from runners 
that they've completed training runs on the course, a one-hour time limit for racers to reach the summit, and sweeps of the mountains by volunteers after each wave of the race. Everyone involved in this race asks the same question. How does someone disappear during a three-mile race and be lost forever with no trace? He was never seen near the ascent and with only one and a half miles to go downhill. He was never seen. Five years after Michael disappeared, not one piece of physical evidence has ever surfaced. He quite literally vanished into thin air. After the settlement had been announced, the chamber issued a press release claiming victory. Hours later, Michael's widow Peggy she released a press release too and she said this suit was never about the money Michael's son-in-law Curtis said that the entire family had collectively made a decision to settle the case after a superior court hearing at which time it became clear that it would be very hard to win a case Peggy alluded to this in a statement which read, We have settled our case because we have no body. As we found as the case proceeded, it is difficult to go to trial without a body to prove that the Chamber of Commerce was responsible for his death. The judge ruled against the estate for emotional distress because of state law on this. And Peggy said in her response that without a body the emotional distress never goes away what a catch-22 you can't win a lawsuit without a body you can't claim that you're going through emotional distress yet on the other hand she'll never live a life without emotional distress because she has no body to bury. At one point, the Chamber of Commerce officials were apparently suspicious that the whole disappearance had actually been staged. They demanded all of Peggy's financial information in pre-trial filings in an apparent search for money trail that might lead to a still living Michael. None was ever found. But in the settlement, the Chamber's press release highlighted the fact that no body was found and that Peggy moved to have Michael declared dead shortly after the search ended. They said he was presumed dead through a court action initiated by his wife Peggy on July 17, 2012, two weeks after he disappeared. The Chamber press release also suggested evidence had surfaced revealing that Michael's sight was so poor that he should not have been in the race. Peggy denied that Michael had any eyesight issues that would have limited him for the race. But at trial, the jury would have had to consider medical records, which showed that Michael had lost considerable vision in both eyes due to advanced glaucoma and experienced total obliteration of his lower field of vision in the years leading up to his disappearance. In fact, Michael's limitation was so significant that in 2009 he filed a complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission against his employer, claiming he was being discriminated against due to his disability. At a subsequent deposition, the statement said that Michael told the investigators that what I see as far as peripheral vision is everybody from the top of their head to the tip of their nose. It was over a month before I realized that my supervisor had a goatee. Now, that seems bad, right? What the chamber press release failed to mention 
was that the EEOC records dated to a time when Michael was recovering from eye surgery. The surgery was successful and his vision improved. In a statement, Peggy said, about Mike's vision, Mike had a valid driver's license and on his last visit with his eye doctor, he had 20-30 vision without glasses. Mike had lost peripheral vision, but all he had to do was move his head and look down. Mike was recovering from glaucoma surgery during the time of the EEOC case. The Chamber of Commerce said that the settlement freed it from any responsibility for Michael's disappearance. They said that everyone agrees that although Michael Lamott's disappearance is indeed a tragedy, the Chamber, as Mount Marathon race organizers, is not at fault. We owe our gratitude, and then they thanked their lawyers. Then the press release went on to blame Michael for what happened to him. It read, race volunteers spoke with Mr. Lamott as he was approaching the turnaround point and let him know that the race was over. The statement said, numerous witnesses, including one medical doctor, would have testified at trial that Mr. Lamott requested no assistance, appeared to be in no distress, and wished to continue to the top of the mountain, which is interesting that they released that in their press release, considering they were ready to go to trial and say that the man was blind, in which case I would assume he would be having difficulties when the doctor saw him. But that's just my opinion. Also, Michael, the chamber statement said, had earlier been warned of Mount Marathon's dangers. All 2012 racers were told if you haven't been up on the mountain, you have no business participating in this event, the release noted. Michael had not been up on the mountain, despite the warning, which stopped short of blocking those who hadn't gone before. Michael signed a waiver of liability in order to participate and headed onto the mountain against the wishes of family members who had counseled him not to do the race. And as I mentioned before, two other racers were injured in the same race. One recovered, one is still recovering from a severe brain injury. Chamber officials clearly believe that there was little more that they could have done to prevent the tragedy. Michael's family clearly believes race organizers hold some obligation to try and make the race safe as possible. In a statement that Peggy released, she said, The Chamber has fought viciously and denies that they have any responsibility to any racer. The fact remains that they left my husband on the mountain knowing he was there. The fact remains that they do not or did not have a safety plan. The fact remains that the mountain was in the worst weather condition ever. They have no race director who could have made a decision to call off that race due to unsafe conditions. Two people were also severely injured during the 2012 race, and my husband lost his life. And since then, the race has gotten safer. As I mentioned above, there were new safety standards implemented. However, Peggy's statement goes on to say, Mount Marathon is thoroughly lacking in safety standards and protocol when compared to other adventure races around the country. So they have changed some rules. So I did get what I wanted. I pray that they will never abandon another racer on the mountain like they did Mike. Peggy still wrestles with her husband's disappearance. She writes, I continue to wonder what happened. Did he suffer for an extended period of time? 
Did he try to climb to the top of Mount Marathon? And let me explain this. The race had a false top of the mountain. But it's possible, and there are some theories, that when Michael got to that point, he saw that there was a trail still going up. And perhaps he thought that he had to go to the actual top of the mountain instead of the race top of the mountain. And in which case he might have fallen off or who knows. But the searchers did search the other side of the mountain and, and found nothing. She goes on to say, was he swept out to the ocean through a water corridor by the Sea Life Center after a fall from a ridge? Did he slide under the ice and freeze to death? Did he fall into a crevice? Did he suffer from hypothermia? Was he thinking of his family in his last minutes? We did not get to say goodbye. The response from the Chamber of Commerce was this. The decision to resolve this matter was a business decision made by the Chamber's insurance company and is in no way an admission of liability. The evidence supports the conclusion that the Chamber was not negligent and did not cause or contribute to Mr. Lamott's disappearance or presumed death in any way. So, how did a healthy 65-year-old man disappear from a mountain? And all these years later, there's never been one piece of evidence, not one, not clothing, not his bib, nothing. Thousands of hours, thousands of hours searching, cadaver dogs, helicopters, nothing was found. And if they had used the infrared sooner, could they have found a warm body? Or by the time they used it, was he already too cold? Or did something else happen? Why do people go completely missing, vanish off of mountains, never to be seen again? Thank you for coming to my channel. If you would, please take a moment to subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Also, please click that thumbs up. And if you'd like to be notified of new content, when it goes up or when we have our live podcasts, please click that bell. And if you'd like to support this channel, please consider becoming a member of Patreon. Thank you.